Good morning, guys. It's uh, Sunday morning, and this has been kind of a crazy week. Uh, I guess on Friday, Governor Pritzker saw his shadow, and so we've got six more weeks of quarantine. Um, you know, and it's becoming increasingly hard to understand what what to believe, right? I mean, uh, I guess on May 1st, we are now required to wear masks out in public. Um, even though the Surgeon General just announced that masks are ineffective for the general public and we shouldn't buy them. And, you know, you got uh, people out there, uh, we've got it confirmed that some states have been doctoring their numbers and recording all deaths as COVID deaths, regardless of the cause. And so it's hard to know uh, what to believe. Is this a serious pandemic that we should be worried about? Is this some kind of political ploy to wreck the economy? Is it uh, fake news? Is it being, you know, made to be a bigger deal than it is? Is it a bigger deal than we think? What is it? I don't know. It's hard to know what to believe and who to trust. And it's hard to trust God sometimes when it feels like we just don't know what's going on. We don't know what to believe. We don't know where to turn. It feels like we're on a journey without a map and we're just confused, uh, which reminds me of a guy who took a journey without a map in uh, Genesis. A guy you've probably heard of, Abraham. Uh, or Abram, as he was called then. Uh, but for simplicity, I'm just going to call him Abraham the whole time. Uh, Abraham, God comes to him and he says, Hey, I want you to take a trip. I want you to journey to a land that I will show you. And Abraham says, Okay, cool. Where are we going? And God says, I'll tell you when we get there. Right? <laughs> Your parents ever tell you that growing up? Where are we going, Dad? I'll tell you when we get there. Uh, but that makes sense when dad is driving because he knows where he's going, right? It's a lot tougher when you're driving and don't know where you're going. I had this happen one time. We were, uh, I was helping one of the ladies at hospice to uh, collect things for the gala. And um, she was like, well, I'm not coming back right away. So you should drive your car and I'll drive my truck and you can just follow me and help me load it and unload it. And so I'm like, okay. And I said, why don't you give me the address and I'll meet you there. And she said, well, I don't have the address. She says, let me call the guy that I'm, that's letting us in and, and get the address from him. So she calls him and he says, no, I'll just tell you how to get there. So I have to meet her in West Frankfurt. And then she's driving her truck. I'm driving my car. And the guy who knows where we're going is the passenger in her truck, giving her directions as we're going. Why? I have no idea why that's how we did it, but that's how we did it. But even that is easier than what Abraham's doing, where God's like, just wander around and I'll tell you when you've arrived, right? I mean, God obviously helped Abraham a little more than that, but that's how it would feel. I'm just going to wander around and eventually God's going to be like, okay, stop. You've made it. Uh, but Abraham does it because Abraham trusts God, even when it seems weird, even when it seems like he's wandering around looking for a place that he doesn't know where it is, he trusts God. And this is a, a theme in Abraham's life, this idea of trusting God. In fact, there are two times in Abraham's life where he doesn't trust God that's recorded in scripture, uh, both the same situation. Uh, there's a famine in the land and Abraham rolls with a pretty big posse, so he's got to have food for all these guys. And so he goes to, one time it's Egypt, one time, uh, I don't remember where, but it's like the, the king is named Abimelech. Uh, he goes to these people, and as he's getting close, he looks over at his wife, and he's like, man, you are so hot. I think that the king is going to try and kill me in order to have you. So let's tell him you're my sister, right? And so both times they go in, they say, yeah, she's my sister. And both Pharaoh and Abimelech just give Moses presents and gifts trying to impress Sarah. And then they try and marry her. And God's like, 
that's a no-no, and he punishes both of them for, for trying to marry another man's wife. And they both get mad, and they're like, this is terrible. Why did you do this to me? Why didn't you just tell me she was your wife? Bad things happen when Abraham doesn't trust God. And so ultimately, uh, you know, we know the story of Abraham. He's a super old man. God comes to him and says, you're going to have a son, and I will make you the father of many nations through your son. Uh, the son's name is Isaac, as most of us know. Uh, and it's, it's fun. His name is Isaac because Isaac means laughter. Because when God originally comes and tells Abraham and Sarah they're going to have a baby, Sarah laughs. She's like, at my age, I'm old. My womb is dried up. Uh, I don't think I'm having a baby. And she laughs about it. And so when they have Isaac, she names him Isaac, which means laughter. Uh, and then a weird thing happens that requires a lot of trust. Think about this. Have you ever, well, not have you ever, but there's something that you really, really want, right? We all have that thing, that like dream thing. Maybe it's a dream house. Maybe it's a, a dream uh, car. Maybe it's a boat that you want. Uh, maybe it's, I don't know. I don't know what it is for you, that thing that you just really want. And kind of in the back of your head, you're like, I know I'm never going to get it, but I would really like to have it. Or maybe it's something that you do think you can achieve and you're working hard to save money or build skills or whatever it is you need to get that thing that you just really, really want. Uh, the easiest example that comes to me, I've got a son who's going to be 16 in August. And every 16-year-old boy, probably most 16-year-old girls too, I don't know, I've never been a 16-year-old girl, uh, they've got that dream car. That car that they're like, if I could have that the day I get my license, that would be the best, right? So imagine that situation. Imagine you're a 16-year-old and, you know, you get your license and mom or dad's like, hey, uh, I got something for you out in the driveway. And you go out there and it's that dream car. That car that you've just been wanting. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a 67 Charger. Uh, that burnt orange color, black racing stripes. If any of you have one of those laying around, I'll take it off your hands. Uh, anyway, it's sitting there. And you're like, oh, this is so awesome. You're so excited. And, you know, you get to drive it around. You take it to school and you show it off. And after driving it around for about a month, uh, mom or dad comes to you and you say, and say, hey, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to jump in your car, drive down to the junkyard. Uh, they're going to go ahead and crush this car and give you a uh, an old beetle it's kind of rusted and beat up doesn't run real well but they're going to give you that uh, in exchange for this car that they're going to go ahead and crush and sell for scrap metal excuse me what uh no you, you can't have my baby yeah no I, i'm gonna need you to do that you're kidding right no i'm serious i need you to go and take your car down there right I don't think so. That's not that's not something that I want to do, right? Well, that's the situation that Abraham is faced with, but on a much bigger scale because this child that they've been waiting their whole lives for, this child of promise that God has said, I will make you a great nation through Isaac. God comes to him and says, hey, I'm going to need you to kill him. Right? We find this in Genesis Chapter 22, I'm going to go ahead and read the story, and we'll, we'll make some comment as we go along here. But Genesis 22, it says, After these things, after God you know, gives them a son, Isaac, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Here again, which I shall tell you. Just go over there and I'll, I'll point it out when you get there. Uh, but he says, take your son, this son that you love, this son that I promised you would be a great nation through Isaac, and I want you to kill him and set him on fire. Yeah, I don't think that's something I want to do, right? So what does Abraham say? 
Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abraham's like, okay, let's do it. God says it. I'm going to do it. I trust God. Hebrews tells us that uh, Abraham knew that God had a plan. And he thought, if I do this, if I kill my son, God can bring him back to life. Because God promised me I would have a great nation through Isaac. And so God can bring him back. Uh, the Bible doesn't actually say that that's what Abraham thought said, but the writer of Hebrews says that's what he thought. All right, verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Some translations say, and we will come again to you. Say, you know, Showing that Abraham believed that God would do some kind of miracle and that Isaac would return with him. Uh, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac ain't no fool. He realizes something's missing here. And this is weird what's going on. I don't know if he's quite put it together that he's the offering, but he knows something's missing. Uh, verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. I will tell you, Isaac is 100% freaking out. Uh, I know this from personal experience. Uh, we, one time when I was young, we uh, were telling this story in junior church. And my uncle was the guy teaching. And so, of course, I got volunteered to play Isaac in this little story. All right. So he ties my hands and puts me on the table. And he's got a knife. And I am almost peeing my pants. I know he's not actually going to stab me because... For one, I know how the story ends, and for two, this is a play, not real life. But I am terrified. So I know that Isaac, who doesn't know it's not going to happen, uh, and Moses, who doesn't know it's not going to happen, are both terrified in this situation. So what happens? I know we know the, the rest of the story, most of us, but let's go ahead and read it. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord, a lot of people think that when it says the angel of the Lord, like the angel of the Lord, not an angel of the Lord, that that's actually pre-incarnate Jesus there. And based on the way that he talks and the things that he says, uh, that makes sense. It's highly possible that this is actually Jesus uh, here in this situation. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the pl that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham trusts God, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how dark it looks, regardless of how bad it looks, regardless of what's going on in his world. Abraham trusts God. Now, that may be partly due to the fact that there were two times that he didn't trust God and he saw how bad it turned out. Sometimes it takes us not trusting God and trying to do it on our own and seeing how bad we mess it up in order for us to trust God. But Abraham trusts him no matter what. 
And guys, that's what we need to do. I know it's hard, right? It's hard sometimes when things are going weird. It's hard when you lose your job. It's hard when you're quarantined and, and can't see anybody. It, it's hard when you, you know, you wreck your tractor or your car or you lose your house or, you know, the dishwasher breaks or the my dryer right now. I'm trying to get my dryer to work and I fixed it the other day and now it's worse than it was before. Uh, and that's not because I'm mechanically inept. I know how to fix a dryer, but I, I, I don't know. When things don't make sense, it's hard to trust that God has a plan, right? When we can't see the plan, when we feel like we're making a trip without a map, it's hard to trust God. But when I look back, I see that the only times that things really got bad were when I tried to do it on my own. That when I trust God, he always comes through. And I know in the moment that is hard. Right now I've got some things going on in my life that I am struggling to trust, as I'm sure the rest of you do too. But when I look back, I see that he always, always, always comes through. And if I look at the times that things really got bad, it's my fault for trying to do it on my own. And those situations quickly resolve themselves when I finally say, okay, God, I'm sorry, I'm done. You take care of it. And then he does. Guys, no matter how bad things seem right now, and I know they seem bad, I'm stuck in the house like the rest of you. Uh, I'm under this quarantine thing. I, I can't go eat at my favorite restaurant. I can't shop at some of the stores that I like. Uh, I can't go see my friends. I can't go out to a movie. There's all kinds of things that, I, that in the past I took for granted, my ability to do things. And now I can't do them because of this quarantine. I get it. We're all in this together. Hashtag. Hashtag. We're all in this together. I know it's stupid, but we are in a tough spot. And those tough spots make it hard to trust God. But that doesn't change the fact that he is there and that he knows what's going on. Even though it may seem like the world is in chaos, he's in control. And he's got this covered. So this week, take a breath, take a minute, remember that God is in control and we can trust him regardless of the circumstances. I love you guys. I'm praying for you. Uh, I can't wait to see you in person again. Have a great week.